spring gardens, which we'll get more into, are uh, another way to capture rainwater and use it really efficiently and let it uh, get cleaner. Um, and hopefully are uh, a project that is a little bit more approachable to, to a um, novice gardener um, or somebody who doesn't have the budget to repave their the sidewalks or their driveway, but was probably gonna redo their garden and dig a hole in the yard anyway and so this is this is what they're going to consider instead um so rain garden is another form of bioretention um doesn't require um any other structure like a tank um they can in more um robust applications or in larger scenarios but your front yard rain garden does not need a, a retention tank um, so if you look at the picture on the left there, they're in a little depression um, in, in the ground that can either be a natural depression or one that you do dig out um, because you want that water to collect there, not necessarily stay there. In fact, you don't want the water to stay there, um, but you want it to collect and slowly soak back into the ground instead of running off into the, the sidewalks and the streets. Um, as far as how to pick a location for your rain garden, um, again, you want to look at the natural flow of the water. Where would you expect it to end up anyway? Um, where do your downspouts lead? Where does, which way is your driveway sloping or the sidewalk in front of your house sloping? Are your neighbors, do they have a sloped yard that, that you know drains into your backyard? Um, those are things to consider. Um, when trying to find a location. That being said, again, you don't want to pick a location where the water is going to stay or it already collects there and causes a big pool in your backyard. That's not a good spot for a rain garden um, because you want the water to be able to soak into the ground. And if you know that it doesn't do that um, right there, then that's not the best spot for a rain garden. You can um, and often need to uh, amend your soil. So add add something to it, whether it's gravel or sand to make it drain a little faster. Um, but you still don't want to, you still don't want it to be in that area of standing water. Um, one thing to consider regarding the standing water is that um, that's where mosquitoes breed and we hate mosquitoes. I hate them, your neighbors hate them, your neighborhood hates them. Um, so if you have standing water elsewhere on your, on your lawn, um, maybe a rain garden is a, an option for you to alleviate that standing water and, and get it moving and back into the ground. Um, so basically the goal would be to intercept um, the pathways of water before they get to those areas where the water is standing. So when we talked at the earlier slide about the, um, hydrologically planning your yard, uh, Sometimes it just takes uh, taking a walk in your yard on a rainy day and seeing where where is the water coming from and where is the water going uh, and how can you help make the most of what nature is already doing in your yard. Yeah, definitely. Intercept, intercept is a great, great way to put it. Um, and I am certainly not a rain garden installation expert, um, but there are a number of really, really awesome resources out there um, that can definitely make this a more approachable project. Um, the one listed here on the slide, um, the Yukon Nemo project or rain garden project from the Nemo program is really excellent. Um, they have a, a cost calculator, a size calculator. Um, they make a lot of um, plant suggestions as well, specific to New England. Um, and then if we could, actually not quite yet, but we'll talk about a couple more resources as far as planning for that rain garden because um, you wanna do it, do it right. Um, like in, a, in any project, you wanna execute it well. <laughs> so these are just a couple examples of rain gardens. Two of them you can tell are residential projects. Um, the one in the top left hand corner, I'll admit, I'm not sure where that's from. It looks like a smaller garden, but this um, plastic cap tells me that there is some sort of infrastructure underneath there. Um, so whether it's a, um, a perforated drain that is, you know, a plastic or some structure that is 
charging that water back into the into the ground as opposed to just a gravel layer. Um, there's something else going on there. And then the bottom right hand corner is a very large rain garden that was installed this uh, last spring um, at the Winter Island Park here in Salem. Um, so all of that runoff you can see there is a parking lot very close to the ocean which is also visible in that picture and it was three to four acres of parking lot that just all rushed off right there was washing out the beach there and carrying all that runoff directly into the ocean and with this rain garden installation that stormwater is now being captured um, filtered through the ground there um, and is frankly pretty nice to look at so this is a picture taken right after it was installed and now it is um, well planted, well established, um, and it's really it's really great. Um, but the the two residential ones again have native plants in them. Looks like I frankly I don't know any of them. I'm so sorry. I don't know anything about plants. But there's some um, hosta in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I yeah. think I see some zinnias. I was gonna say zinnias. Um, but again, in a nice depression, a natural depression in their yard. Um, so where that water, you know, wanted to pass through anyway, and this just makes it a, a an easier path. And reinvent infrastructure is also, um, as we mentioned before, a great way uh, for communities to really build up their green areas and help control their stormwater and help control flooding. And they're just really fun community projects. Um, so you can see a couple of projects going on here. Uh, Remind me which, which road that's along in Salem, Maggie? Commercial Street. So that is, um, was a community funded, a Salem, Salem got a, a grant um, to install this rain garden and the, and the Winter Island rain garden um, right along the North River, which you can see just a tiny bit of there on the left. Um, so this is right off of 114 in Salem, it's still in Salem, not in the super developed um, Danvers Peabody part but um, and this is actually when the North River is super super high tide it, which it looks pretty high in this picture um, it actually comes over that that walkway there so this is actually a, a saltwater rain garden um, this shown here is the first round of plantings um, but most of them have been replaced with um, salt marsh grasses and um, salt tolerant plants um, uh, which, is, and, which is interesting. And what we've learned from other organizations like ours um, from and various different community groups uh, from doing these projects is that green scapes are excellent for community projects because the whole point is that they are very low maintenance. Um, but even among greenscapes, there are champions <laughs> for low maintenance. And so we found that when it comes to community gardens, shrubs are really king because shrubs <laughs> don't need much from us. Uh, once you plant them, if you plant them in the right spot, they'll do great. Birds love shrubs. Uh, you can get a variety of different blooming shrubs so they can be quite visually beautiful. Um, you can get ones that provide food for wildlife. So they're really great and they don't, it's pretty hard to mess them up. <laughs> so they're a great option if you're just getting into greenscaping too and you're not um, an experienced gardener start with shrubs. They're great and they take up a lot of space. <laughs> so you get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, again, just to touch on those a couple other resources as far as um, plant suggestions and um, cost calculators. Um, this is just a snippet from the UNH extension um, rain garden program that they have or rain garden resource that they have and you'll see this is just two plants there but they've listed how um, like what amount of water this plant tolerates or likes what amount of sun and shade this plant likes um, when it seasonally blooms who who as far as bugs birds bees who it attracts um, which is something of course to consider so um, even if we at Salem Sun Coast Watch or, or Rachel at Irwa are not the, the rain garden specialists, they are out there and there's lots and lots of, of, of great info um, to, to make these projects a little easier um, for the novice gardener who just wants to, to mix it up and to 
start this new project. So don't be daunted. Um, you can do it. <clears throat> uh, so here's a really nice image of a great little lawn that mixes uh, having those lower turf areas with lots of um, little oasis gardens. And as you can see, um, and this is from National Wildlife Federation, you can see they've considered a few different things, uh, including wildlife and uh, other native species. Um, so things to consider when you're gardening uh, it are whether this is going to provide habitat or food for um, butterflies, for birds, for little mammals, um, for snakes. Some people hate snakes, but they do take care of the insects. So I, I love snakes, but not everyone, I know. <laughs> And uh, even fragrance, uh, having a, you know, a walk through your yard can be a different uh, olfactory experience for you as well, and not just visual. Uh, and there are seasonal considerations. Um, this, this slide makes me smile because all these pictures are actually from my childhood lawn, <laughs> and that's my garden in the bottom left. So we didn't even plan it that way. So you can see you can allow um, plants like clover and violets uh, and dandelions and buttercups to grow up in your yard. Uh, clover is especially great because it um, helps your other plants get nitrogen uh, by fixing it. Uh, and if you ever want to read into the actual science behind how that happens, it's very fascinating. <laughs> um, leaves that fall in your yard are, you know, plants just doing their job of providing the best environment for themselves. So they'll actually create their own ground cover to help lock water in and also to provide nutrients. Um, so you might not want those on grassy areas where it might smother the grass, but uh, you can certainly use all those rakings um, to help on your plant beds and to make your plants nice and cozy and happy. Uh, and letting wildflowers grow as well. So I think those are some fluids maybe up in the top left corner. So it doesn't always have to be things that you've planted. I see you can... you a nod there, Rachel. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice identification. Um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, so it's nice to let those um, native little critters creep in too. And it can be really exciting sometimes when a plant shows up in your yard that you didn't put there. Uh, it just made its way there. Unless, of course, it's poison ivy or bittersweet. <laughs> but that does happen too. Uh, so we're going to go a little bit quickly through the suggestions of plants, but we'll come back to them during the Q&A. Um, but here are just some, <laughs> some things. Uh, red maple is not to be confused with Japanese maple. There is a native red maple, and then there are Japanese maples, which are non-native, but do very well here. Um, similar climate zones. White pines, which are actually the tallest trees uh, in eastern North America. So I'm a big fan of them. They do a lot. Uh, river birch, so, uh, and there's a lot of different things to consider with trees as well, um, especially their root structures. So understanding how the tree grows is important. There's lots of native, native shrubs, um, and as you can see, there's ones that bloom in the summer, there's ones that have berries in the winter, which hazel, of course, is interesting because it's blooming in, in the autumn when most things are not blooming. <laughs> Uh, shrubs, as we said, we love shrubs. They're really easy to take care of and you can get a lot of different um, interest and variety texturally and bearing fruit or having flowers. Uh, native ground covers are also a really nice alternative to grass. Um, and if you have the right area, they'll kind of just take over and do their thing. So especially if you have very shaded areas under trees, native ground covers can be a great solution more of them. Uh, everyone loves a fern. Ferns are really interesting. Some of the plants that have been around forever, so it's always nice to invite them into your space. Uh, sage, so you can add some interesting smells with your ground cover as well. And then of course there's lots of different perennials to choose from. Um, asters, which are just like vibrantly colorful. The bees hang around them like crazy. Um, Echinacea spread really well and the finches like their seeds. So there's a lot of different things to consider with all these uh, different plants. I'll let you do the summary, Maggie. Yeah, so we're just gonna sum it up so we can get to a, um, a Q&A. Um, again, I know we had a lot a of interest in, in, um, in plant suggestions, so I don't wanna skim over that too much. 
Um, so yeah, Rachel, I just want to summarize what it is to Greenscape and, and how easy it can be, what it, what it could look like, um, decreasing your lawn size to, to use that space more sustainably for stormwater cleanliness and water conservation. Importance, um, we stress the importance of using native plants that require less water, so that's a, an economic benefit for you um, and an ecological benefit for for the neighboring plants and other other wildlife that wants that native habitat. Um, greenscaping mainly just has a much lower um, and more positive impact on water resources and that's that's why we promote it so so heavily. Um, and you can see examples of some of these LID projects that we've been showing on our website. So if you go to the greenscapes.org website, you can use our LID tool uh, and it'll show you where around the, uh, the state there are uh, green and gray infrastructure projects that you can go see how they're dealing with stormwater and um, minimizing their water use. Um, yeah, I know that that map screenshot is not, um, not beautifully represented um, in the PowerPoint here. So definitely check it out on our website. Um, there is an option to, to add to this viewer. Um, we wanted to, to make this a, a tool to show that low impact development is, is a um, achievable goal in your community and it can be easily incorporated into any sort of development project or retrofit project. Um, and you as community members really do have the voice to, to, to to make that important in, in your town. So um, we do encourage you to advocate for it whenever you can. Be the change. I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, greenscapes are not just about your own space, but um, shifting the norms around what our gardens and yards should be. Uh, and you can maybe be the first one on your street. Um, maybe everyone on your street does this. That's awesome. Sounds like a cool street. Sounds like all the cool people <laughs> live there. Uh, and you can also help bring those projects into your community. So whether you're um, involved with schools or a business or something like that, really uh, being the first one to say, I think that we, if we're gonna do anything, should do it the right way and make our community more beautiful and more sustainable. Um, and that's something we're really considering right now, uh, especially with Ipswich River, uh, development is really increasing on the North Shore. So making sure that when we do develop, when we do create these new places, we're keeping water in mind. Uh, because as I talked about before, the Ipswich River is so important for providing the water for so many people. Um, and it's already stressed. Uh, so when we're getting more developments, we really can't ask the river to give more. It's giving a lot already. Uh, but we know that that's a lot. Um, you know, we towns still need to grow, new people still need to come in, we need to have new business. Uh, so we're looking at ways for communities to have water neutral growth. So still growing, still changing, but not impacting our water resources. So we actually have a net zero water use toolkit that we have developed, and we're working with towns to roll that out and really give them the tools and tips they need that will help them make their towns the most efficient water users and conservers uh, that they can.